Good, thank you. Yeah, I do get this sort of recurring sense that um, these wider benefits have been discussed at this round table uh, a good number of times before. I think Steve was implying sort of done, done to death, possibly. Uh, but anyway, um, maybe the group changes. Yeah, the table stays the same and the, uh, the, the, the group evolves. Um, so I suppose a good deal of what I'm going to say you know, may be familiar, but perhaps there'll be uh, one or two sort of new elements in it. Uh, my thinking has, has evolved a little bit. Um, so uh, let me get on with it. OK, um, motivation uh, problem statement. Um, clear to all of you, I think. But let me, let me st start off uh, by, by restating what I think are the sort of issues uh, an objective here in thinking about this. Uh, standard user benefit approach to cost benefit says value the user benefits. Uh, things beyond that, you know, the quantity changes all through the economy, uh, but there's zero value, price equals marginal cost everywhere, all these little changes, we can ignore them uh, for social uh, evaluation purposes. Um, that's my definition of the traditional uh, cost-benefit, user-benefit user approach uh, in any case. But of course, we all have this sort of deep instinct, I think, that transport is kind of yeah, really fundamental uh, in shaping the way the economy operates, certainly shaping cities, um, the formation of cities, the effectiveness of cities, you know, what really drives uh, city growth. So we've all got this you know, fun fun fundamental view about the importance of transport. So the challenge is um, to capture the ideas uh, that are uh, underlying that, to capture them, uh, to formalize them, without opening the floodgates to a load of nonsense coming through. So to capture these ideas, but not such that anything goes, and we can all say increasing returns to scale and think of a big number. So uh, capturing the ideas based um, in rigorous <coughs> economics that imposes a discipline, hopefully also gives a route into uh, quantification so we can capture the ideas, but um, in a tight, precise way. So that's the real reason why we're doing this. I think there are other reasons as well, um, as I say here. Uh, engaging fully with, 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 other, with other stakeholders. I mean, Jonas was talking at the end of the last session about the importance of uh, what we do, um, having policy credibility. Um, if we head off, I mean, in the HS2 debate in Britain, um, you know, there was formal analysis doing one thing, a public debate about something else, and if the two don't meet in the middle, then clearly um, there's a real sort of credibility problems and risks to our engagement in public policy. Uh, so making sure that uh, we're engaged with stakeholders. Now, we, we, we might think that some of the things they care about, like GVA, uh, are inappropriate, um, where we should be uh, concentrating on welfare. Um, they're certainly often talking about local impacts, about the, you know, the city mayor talking about the impact on his city, which is perfectly legitimate, even if the policymakers' uh, concern is that yeah, a somewhat higher national level. So we've got to engage fully, fully with that. Okay, so following from those observations, what, what, what do we need to be doing? I've put <coughs> a number of sort of introductory points here, uh, which, which, which I think are important. First, we have to have an appraisal methodology that really does mean that the strategic case and the economic case uh, for a transport project uh, in, uh, are integrated and interact. Uh, that means really, it means that people doing appraisal should think what the project is actually for. Um, if there's some strategic objective it's designed to achieve, then that a better feature in the appraisal uh, rather than having the appraisal just going through a set of you know, tick box things. So doing that integration, I think, is important. Uh, recognizing that the spatial distribution of GVA and things you know, is of interest uh, might not be the number we're ultimately concerned with, but we you know, shouldn't dismiss it. We should recognize it's, it's of interest. Then, you know, the core analytical task, obviously identifying and measuring the wider benefits. And I think trying to come up with a one-dimensional value for this, although we'll, we'll, we will be debating this uh, tomorrow a little more, I imagine. But, you know, money is... One of the advantages of the money metric is that you can compare, you can, uh, compare things once you put them in that same, that, that same metric. 
But of course, uh, doing all that in a manner that's feasible, proportional, transparent. Um, well, I've said it there, not excessively dependent on the uh, consultants running very large models. Uh, we want a toolkit that ideally we can apply in a rather sort of modular way, where possible a bottom-up way, uh, yeah, based on local information, capturing this without having to run some enormous model every time. So that's the, uh, my view of the approach of where we should be aiming. A schema that I use sometimes to think about this you know, there's user benefits tracing down the uh, left-hand side here in, in the standard way. But then there's sort of economic geography in the middle. You know, transport changes how close I am to you, even if you don't actually move. You know, effective uh, proximity changes. And also it's changing the location of households, firms, whatever it is. It is moving stuff around the economy. So it's these changes that I think uh, have value. Therefore, we need to study the changes and value them. Now, what I want to talk about today are the three elements of wider benefit that I think are probably quantitatively uh, the most important and the ones where we should be concentrating. First one is the uh, productivity argument. Uh, proximity, agglomeration, the benefit of cities, uh, all that stuff. I think there are fairly well-established methodologies and a fairly good empirical basis for doing that. I'll talk about that stuff fairly quickly, I hope, but with, with, with a little bit of detail. I don't know how much uh, people do know, know about it. Uh, move me on if, uh, if, I, if everybody knows it. I'll talk about that a, a little bit. But I think there's an established and good methodology there. Then I want to talk about um, the effects of induced private investment and land use change. What I want to get hold of there is the idea that transport changes the attractiveness of a location. You know, you do the, uh, you do the transport, and that regenerates your city centre, makes it a vibrant place, the stuff goes on. I think it is possible to develop a fairly simple, straightforward methodology for getting hold of that, and that's what I want to present. I'm not sure that that methodology is in use at present, but let me throw it out and um, see, see how people react. And I'm not sure it's in the paper that was circulated either, by the way. I've you know, tightened up thinking a little bit since, since writing that. Uh, and then the third thing, yeah, in quantitative terms, that's bound to be large is labor market stuff, employment. But you know, let me preview what I'm going to say. I'm really going to put that up in order to shoot it down again. Um, but you know, quantitatively, uh, it, it's bound to matter. Um, it, 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 it's got to be there. So those are the three things I basically want to talk about. Um, and for each of those, um, yeah, it's important to have to understand the mechanism, what's going on, the strategic case, the narrative of why this particular project yeah, may do something on any one of those headings. Um, then obviously we have to, if we think it is important, we have to put a social valuation on it, making sure we're not double counting uh, it's, it's a real gain, not just transfer payments, whatever. We've got, got to make sure the valuation stuff is okay. Then we've got to think, you know, is there a practical methodology uh, to be able to do it? So that's sort of outlining what I want to do. Uh, let me start with the first of those, just a couple of slides on the uh, productivity, uh, proximity, agglomeration, and all that. And this may be well known, but let me, let me, let me run through it uh, in any case. The mechanism. Yeah, transport enables connectivity. That's uh, what seems to be a buzzword that's uh, increasingly used at the moment, uh, for better or worse. Um, it's really just Adam Smith, right? Its scale and specialization is determined by the size of the market, and if transport effectively increases the size of the market, that's good for scale and specialization, right? That's, that's the heart of it. Um, so good transport systems allow um, better matching of workers with jobs. They allow firms to be big and for you to have intense competition. You know, they've shifted that, that trade-off if you're in a large, dense, thick, thick market. Um, above all, I think it's this sort of specialization, right? Uh, you, have, you have an incentive in workers' firms have a real incentive to get very good at narrow specializations if you're in a big market where you know you're going to be able to sell that specialization to more than one bidder. Uh, if you're in a small 
you're in a very small market, you can't sell it at all. If you're in a medium-sized market, you might be able to sell it to one person, but you'll be held up and won't get the return. But if you're in a big market, you can specialize right, uh, as, as workers and as firms, and that um, raises productivity. Um, Okay, so the mechanism there, lots of papers on agglomeration dating back, you know, goodness, goodness knows how, how far. Um, I thought there was something else on that slide. I hope this is the latest version of the slides that we've got here, because I was changing them this morning. Uh, the other thing I thought was there was that face-to-face -face is still important. Um, I thought I'd added that as a, as, as a bullet point. Maybe, maybe I didn't. I do hope we've got the latest version because it diverged a lot towards the end. Um, okay, um, that's the mechanism. Social value from this, yeah. So people are productive in these you know, dense, thick markets, whatever. Um, that raises their productivity. Uh, a flag to wave here, of course. Obviously, productivity might go up with good transport just because you know truck drivers can drive further in a, in a day. That that raises their productivity. I'm talking about effects over and beyond that. Um, the truck driver, the consequent reorganisation of all the logistics, all that. Right. That there's no market failure there. That's happening internal to firms. Uh, well, not, it could be external, but without market failures. So that is all captured by user benefit root of a half, all that stuff. So this is uh, what I'm talking about are effects on top of that. That the underlying, uh, the underlying force there is that there are yeah, market failures, reciprocal externalities of uh, engaging in these uh, thick, thick markets, uh, increasing return. Okay, so that's the mechanism. We believe it applies in some contexts, not in others. It has to be tested context by context. We have a methodology, I think, for getting hold of it, which comprises two parts, as represented by the two arrows uh, on the bottom line there. So one part is from a particular project to how that affects um, effective density, as it's commonly known. I called it access to economic mass, uh, which I think is more accurate but probably stupid of me to try to introduce new terminology for anything, right? So stage one, how transport improvement affects access to economic mass uh, or effective density. Stage two, how effective density uh, interacts with productivity. And I'm measuring that access to economic mass by some inverse distance weighted function of economic activity. So in the equation I've written there, economic activity is employment, uh, F is a decreasing function of, 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 of distance, okay? Ooh, to apply that methodology, what do we need? Well, taking the right hand, two stages in there, taking the right hand half, uh, access to economic mass, how that is related to productivity. The point here is that we have yeah, a well-established, I think pretty robust, high quality uh, econometric literature really investigating that relationship. Um, I'm sure Dan is looking at those numbers and thinking, where the hell did he get those from <laughs> as, as a contributor to that literature? Uh, but the point is, we've got the evidence base at the level of areas, firms, individuals, um, generating this elasticity of productivity with respect to city size, access to mass, whatever it is, of these sorts of numbers, 0, 0.0 something which is a big number, okay? Um, the cross-section, it's huge. Obviously, as you go from a city of 200,000, you know, you're doing a lot of doublings, right? You're getting that, that's a huge elasticity. But even for transport improvements that have a, a non-trivial effect on the number of people employed in the center of London, the number's big enough uh, to get a productivity kick. But the, the point is, this is a well-established literature done at lots of different levels, you know, right down to tracing individuals through their lives as they change jobs, move to the city, come back again to the countryside, whatever. So uh, a depth of empirical research, which I th is, <laughs> is important. There are, you know, we see other numbers used in transport appraisals on the basis of considerably less work uh, uh, than this, I think. That's not to say there aren't any issues left. I've put some of them there. Uh, the spatial range of these things. Um, is it just within a travel to work area? Is it between cities as we join up cities? Um, there are estimates of that, but I think it remains uh, a bit of an issue. Attribution to a particular transport mode is hard. Um, 
we've, you know, if the place is, I don't know, mainly served by road, but you're considering a rail project, uh, quite how does, is that going to feed into changing the effective density? The appropriate controls uh, is, is, is an issue. Um, you know, you'd think you'd have to control for skill, but on the other hand, if someone only acquired the skill because they were in the city, then you shouldn't control for skills, right? So there, there, there are issues, but um, yeah, robust would be my claim. The other step in the quantification application of this is the bit on the uh, left-hand side. So for a particular project, um, how does that change access to economic mass? The point I want to make here is that it happens in two different ways. One has become called, at least by some of my friends in the Department for Transport in Britain, static clustering. Um, that is to say, even if nothing moves, uh, you've become closer together, right? There are DIJs in that mm. equation. Second, things will move, okay? That's the dynamic clustering. Uh, so things will relocate, and that changes the employment, distribution of employment across locations in the equation. So, so two different mechanisms there. This is going to be obviously very important for implementation when you think, you know, do you have to run some huge model? Well, static clustering, no, right? I mean, you've got you know, the change in generalized transport costs there in front of you from, from, the, from the transport stuff. Even for the, the dynamic clustering, I'm going to argue that in many cases you can just use local information, right? The project tells you that, you know, capacity, I mean, I always have crossrail in mind, at the back of my mind when I think of this. The project tells you that so many more, you know, tens of thousands of people will be getting into central London. You're pretty confident that you know, the office space will be created and employment will go up by that many tens of thousands of people. So even the relocation stuff, you're getting from the local level without having to run a huge, great model. Obviously, for other projects, you might have to run the huge, great model to see uh, the full uh, national, national picture. So... Mechanism one I wanted to talk about, wider effect one, was productivity, proximity, agglomeration. Um, to me, yeah, there's the evidence case, the evidence base, uh, the methodology uh, to be able to include it with a reasonable degree of confidence as a wider benefit in appraisals in a context-specific way and without always having to go and run a massive model. Right, there's a scope for doing it, as I say, bottom up with static clustering and looking at the local local changes. Um, I should have, just backing up that slide a little bit, I should, of course, use the word displacement very often. I will use it quite a lot as I go on through, but I should have used it there as well. Uh, but I'll, I'll come back to displacement issues uh, repeatedly as, as we go through. Okay, so one, um, productivity and all that. To um, induced investment and land use change. That was the second of, of my boxes uh, on the way down that uh, schematic slide. Okay, here, yeah, transport induces uh, or enables uh, be better use of land. Is there a wider benefits case there, or is it just, you know, user benefit all, all nicely captured? Um, I want to make the case that I think there are you know, wider benefits and we can develop a methodology uh, to, to, to handle them. Uh, I'm going to do that by means of two examples. The first one is going to be a rather simple uh, sort of residential de dependent development, which is really just going to be, you know, second year undergraduate applied welfare economics, you know, two, two minutes on that. Then a slightly uh, richer, more interesting case, which is the large scale retail or office development. So the city centre that gets you know, the boost as a consequence of uh, having a station or having more commuters uh, or whatever. Um, could just be the supermarket on the edge of town, but so, you know, the sort of shopping mall on the edge of town. But really, for the second example, I do have in mind sort of, I mean, not, not necessarily regeneration of a poor area, but revitalization of a city area. So the idea, the idea that transport makes a place more attractive Something, something's going on with the land use change that makes it more attractive. Okay, so they're the mechanisms I want to think about. They're going to have social value if the initial position was suboptimal, um, in which case an expansion of activity will lead to 
and we give them marginal valuations uh, greater than marginal cost will we'll yield the wealth again. So let's see if I can make a sort of credible case for that. Okay, the dependent residential development. This is, as I say, a sec second year sort of undergraduate applied welfare, right? So very quickly, transport invest improvement opens up an area for development. Uh, some sort of initial planning restriction because of ingest congestion, that's relaxed. You know, what, what's the value of doing that? Well, it's the user benefit plus uh, a bit related to the initial price cost gap and the quantity change. Or to be precise, it's the quantity change times the price cost gap where that first equation is the price cost gap before and after averaged. Um, so it's a linear approximation to integrating along something or other. Okay. Um, obvious elementary stuff, but I put it up here to make a couple of points. First, this may be a large source of you know, additional welfare gain. Call it, yeah, well, let's call it wider benefit. It's over and above uh, the direct user benefits. Providing, of course, that the initial planning controls were suboptimal. Yeah, maybe they were very strict, uh, but for good reason, because they were countering an externality of some sort, setting an externality of some sort. So bear that in mind. Second comment, um, both the planning change and the transport improvement are sort of necessary conditions here. So trying to uh, attribute the welfare gain partly to um, transport and partly to some other policy change doesn't work. All you can say, not looking at anyone in particular, Chris, uh, all, 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 all you can say is that they're both uh, necessary conditions and that sort of attribution isn't going to work. Third comment. Um, some government departments do, I believe, think that um, it can all, that effect can all be captured in land value uplift. That, of course, is true only if the elasticity of demand for the houses built is perfectly, is, is infinitely elastic. Okay? If not, there's a price fall and some of the benefit is passed to the, you know, the, the occupants of the houses whose, whose price has fallen. So land value uplift is an upper bound rather than the correct, correct measure. Okay. Um, that was done for sort of completeness. Let me try and move on to a sort of richer, richer case here. And again, again, try and get a hold of this idea that transport improvement can make places more attractive. Right, the simple model in my mind here, and you can tell me whether this captures the flavor of the argument or not, the simple model in my mind is that. There's a transport improvement. Uh, think, of, you know, shopping, think of this in the shopping context. I'm going to argue it's more general, but think of it as being the shopping context. Uh, transport improvement. So a particular place has more shoppers, uh, increased spending. That increases rents uh, in the location. I'm the developer, so given this increase in rents, I increase space. Uh, think of that as building, okay? I build tall or something, right? So the developer reacts. There's more space, so that means more shops come in. And that brings with it an increased attractiveness. And I've used the language here of monopolistic competition and product differentiation. I mean, I do international trade as well, right? So, yeah. The, the, the idea that trade expands the set of products available, changes the number of firms, changes the number of varieties. So variety sounds a very artificial word to use, but it's referring, referencing that monopolistic competition literature. But of course, the place has therefore become more attractive, um, therefore spending increases, right? So there's an equilibrium, you know, some sort of loop there, and obviously an equilibrium value. Is there any wider benefit associated with this? Well, I think there are two possible sources, of which probably the second is the more important, but let me talk about both of them. First, yeah, it may be that the developer has monopoly power, right? You know, a particular urban site. If you do a big development, then an increased space by a non-marginal amount, that presumably does reduce the price of space compared to what it would be if you hadn't, you know, following the transport improvement, but if you hadn't done the increase. Right? So maybe there's a distortion there. Maybe there was yeah, suboptimal development uh, initially. Right? But more importantly, what we want to capture is the idea of increased attractiveness. Um, so it is the case quite generally that if new varieties, new products, new shops, whatever, are coming in, then the economic agent, the firm that introduces that variety, does not capture all the surplus 
or to be precise, if they're not a perfectly price discriminating monopolist on this new thing, they will not capture all the surplus. So some of it is handed over uh, to, to consumers, in which case that too is suboptimal and expanding it is a source of welfare gain. And of course, it's exactly the sort of welfare gain that you know, the new trade theory has been going on about for the last, God, that's part of it, uh, last 30 years, um, for a long time now. But let's think about it in this context. Okay, so developing those ideas a little bit further, those are the two uh, distortions, market failures there, that possibly the transport improvement is interacting with. Uh, so there's wider benefit if either A or B and less than 100% displacement because obviously uh, there are, yeah, this is one shopping area, there are others dotted around. Okay, oops, okay. Um, the point I really want to make here is that the, if we want to get hold of these things, you know, there, there is a literature saying that you model the attractiveness by, I don't know, having some shift in everyone's demand curve. I mean, it's horrible, right? If you want to do this, do it bottom up, right? We know what spending in this location is. We know what it's projected to be once all this commercial development is in place. We know for argument B that the ratio of consum consumer surplus to expenditure is whatever it is, um, one over sigma minus one, where sigma is the uh, price elasticity of demand for the variety, assuming it's isoelastic. So in a very bottom-up way, anchored in things that are sort of commercially visible, right? The expenditure, the projected expenditure. We can get yeah, a methodology to sort of build up these numbers from the bottom up, not from some arbitrary shifts in, in, in demand curves. So I think there's a methodology here that can be used. You know, we can quantify the price cost wedge on due to monopoly power. We can quantify the consumer surplus that might not be captured by uh, developers of these new shops. Okay, so the argument, yeah, I think there is a workable methodology for what I think is an important uh, wider benefit derived, as I've already said, uh, from, from those two effects, A and B, and ground, importantly, grounded in numbers that are subject to some sort of you know, ability to observe them and commercial case that will be being put forward in the development. So that sort of bounds things. It means we're not floating off into a world of ridiculously inflated numbers. Uh, look, look, look at what's happening on the ground or projected to happen on the ground and work up from there. What I've just said there is completely analogous. I, I have said exactly the same thing with the word office substituted for shop. It would have take to, but taken a bit of tweaking and you'd have come out with something isomorphic to the productivity case I made 10 minutes ago, completely isomorphic, where the offices just like being together because there's some uh, spillovers going on. Um, so it's really the same, same model just applied in this other context. Okay, the third mechanism, and I will speed up. I've been going 25 minutes. Um, the labor market stuff. Um, two mechanisms here, I think. Um, one, let's call uh, labor force participation, and the other, employment and unemployment. Labor force participation, again, a little bit of very standard second year applied welfare economics here. Um, yeah. I think for some transport improvements, you can make the case that they increase labor force participation. That may be by you know, a better bus service to an outlying uh, you know, residential estate. It may be by creating job opportunities uh, that draw people into the labor market, reduce the number of discouraged workers. Uh, it may be by encouraging people to commute into the center from the edge, uh, which is the move to better jobs. Uh, heading there if jobs in the center are, are, are better paid. Social value, if there are tax barriers, uh, I say standard applied welfare economics argument, right? If there are barriers to work, your, your marginal product is your, your pre-tax income. When you're taking the decision, you're looking at post-tax income, you're paying your commuting cost or whatever other disutility uh, from, from post-tax income. So there's a wedge and that's just actually equal to the change in tax revenue. Um, on, 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 the, uh, uh, on, on the additional employment or the move to better jobs. So a standard argument there, which I think is important in some contexts and is included in the you know, web tag, um, the, the UK uh, appraisal. Of course, there's another mechanism that uh, yeah, transport improvement creates jobs, reduces unemployment. Um, here, the word displacement does crop up in 
capital letters and bold and whatever. As I said at the beginning, I think it's important to address these arguments because you know, the city mayors, the local stakeholders are going to care about this, right? So it's something that appraisal should, should get hold of locally. But appraisal should be holding the, 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 national, the national ring. It should be the referee on, on the national ring. So we do have to ask very, very critically and carefully, if you're creating jobs in one area, are you just displacing them from another? Uh, maybe it's tradable stuff and you're displacing them from foreigners and capturing them to your country, whatever. But I really think you know, my default position here is that we live in moderately well-functioning capitalist economies that on the whole are not that far, too far away from the natural rate of unemployment. So the default here should be 100% displacement. So in which case, the employment effects are of zero value. So I said on my, the list of three things, yeah, employment had to be there for completeness. Potentially it's large, and we all know the consultant studies that get huge numbers out of uh, job creation effects. But I think it's something we should you know, address uh, largely in order, or partly in order, to, to shoot down to discipline um, at the national level, although quite legitimately the local mayor wants to know. Okay, those are the three points I said I wanted to talk about. Let me very briefly say a little bit about um, forecasting the quantity changes. Um, no point doing all this if it's, um, we've no basis for knowing you know, how much commercial development there'll be in the city or uh, how firms will relocate and things. Um, so can we forecast the uh, quantity changes? Under what circumstances do we need to resort to uh, big, big models to generate these things? Well, as I've already said, some of the things like the static, static clustering, whatever you call it, um, you know without working out all the induced quantity changes. Others, I think you can get hold of bottom up, right? project design, capacity, traffic forecasts, and all that. So you really only need the big models. Um, if you need to know the changes elsewhere, and if those changes are subject to the same imperfections that you're trying to value positive in positive, if there's an employment effect that you're trying to value positively in one place, then you better subtract it elsewhere, right? But if it's growing financial services in London and you're pretty sure that the financial services wouldn't have happened anywhere else, then you don't need to do it, all right? So there's an only if statement on that slide, right? You need to know the changes elsewhere only if they're subject to imperfections that you are counting in the, in the neighborhood uh, of the project. Okay, so a bit of a sort of recap on that. Yeah, um, sort of summarizing, running through. User benefits, no, you don't need the wider modeling because yeah, you've assumed that all the effects are at zero value by assumption. Productivity, static clustering, no, you don't need to do the full modeling. You've just got the distance stuff. Dynamic clustering, no, if the employment change is all determined by you know, the, the, what's going on locally, but yes, if there's displacement. Investment, residential land use, well, the residential example, you surely don't need to know um, because you know, there are planning constraints still in place elsewhere, so it's not, it's not happening anywhere else, right? Um, the commercial stuff, no, if, you know, as above, but yes, if there's displacement. Unemployment, no, if it's participation, that's probably a pretty local sort of thing. Yes, if it's you know, aggregate employment moving around the country, but then I've argued, or at least my preference would be just to assume it's 100%, frankly, in which case you don't need to do the modelling. So what I'm saying, what I'm trying to drive towards here is, yeah, there are these wider effects, and sometimes you might need big models to get hold of them, uh, but not always. So making a sort of plea for um, a sort of modular approach, you know, taking these sort of modules, the various components we've talked about, doing them in a somewhat bottom-up way, getting numbers that you're basically going to add up rather than put together in a sort of full, full model. Where modeling is undertaken, penultimate important point, where modeling is undertaken, it needs to capture the strategic arguments, needs to be tailored to the context. Yeah, simple targeted models are better than large black box models uh, in my view. 
And of course, you think about the sort of incentives in the game here. All the incentive for consultants is to produce an enormously thick report, so an enormously complicated model, and come out with a definite number at the end. Where I think it would be much better if they um, designed a neat, simple, little targeted model trying to tease out a mechanism and produce a nice short report, but probably with a range of scenarios uh, that uh, you can look at and evaluate. But the incentives for the consultancy business is obviously exactly the opposite. Yeah, fat, fat report and definite number, which is unfortunate. Okay, wrapping up. Um, probably said all this. Yeah, we want to capture this idea without letting people go crazy. Um, it's about incorporating changes in location attractiveness. One of the changes is productivity. That's attractiveness to firms. Uh, one is attractiveness to consumers, shoppers, office workers, whatever. That's the uh, commercial development argument. Yeah, when I think about these things, I can come up with a million other market failures, coordination effects, whatever, that could have these sorts of effects. But I think it's important, actually, to concentrate on a few. And I've given you two or three, two or three here. Um, yes, I'm grounded very firmly in the tradition of applied welfare economics. Maybe that's too conservative. I mean, there are dynamic growth effects and all that. But still, well, I'm, I'm, I would argue for grounding it firmly in applied welfare economics. The evidence base, um, I hope tomorrow or later today, we'll be talking about um, using information from uh, yeah, ex post evaluation of, of transport improvements. Um, important, but I think there are a lot of econometric issues of identification, simultaneity. Uh, external validity, all, all these things are a real, real issue there. So the evidence base I'm talking about using in these examples is mainly trying to get you know, good parameters, these elasticities or whatever, trying to really build a research base on that, and then couple them with very you know, detailed down-to-earth information. What's expenditure projected to be in this new wonderful city centre you've got, right? But put that together with the elasticities and we have a story. Um, Final, final point, um, transparency. Um, yeah, you want to do this in a way uh, that it is comprehensible to more than half a dozen people in the country. So it does actually uh, inform a policy debate uh, in, a, in a meaningful way rather than appearing to be a black box. Let me stop there. Thanks.